everyone, and welcome to this edition of Forward Thinking, a Bison Roundtable. I'm Sharon Strange Lewis, Director of Alumni Relations at Howard University. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Today, we are going to discuss a topic that impacts all of us, primaries and midterm elections. This election cycle cannot be ignored. There's so much to talk about, ranging from the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to gerrymandering. So let's get right to the discussion. Today's roundtable will be moderated by our very own Dr. Joe Leonard. He's the director of the Howard University Community Association. He was also a former member of the Obama administration, and he also served in local politics with our DC mayor's office. Dr. Leonard is very well versed both nationally and national politics and local politics. So I can't think of another person who would be um, versed well enough to really navigate this dialogue. So Dr. Leonard, let the round table begin. Much too kind, Ms. Lewis. Uh, well, I'm joined today by Dr. Uh, Robbie Perry and Ms. Uh, Priestley Johnson. Uh, and let me give you some quick background on them. Dr. Perry is, uh, uh, he has a tough position because we've had an illustrious uh, number of chairs of the political science department. One of them is a gentleman on my dissertation committee who I absolutely uh, uh, have been a mentee of his for years and has passed away now and that's Dr. Ron Walters. Uh, but Dr. Perry received his uh, BA from University of Michigan, PhD uh, from uh, Brown University. He's been chair of the Howard University political science department since 2019. Uh, he comes to us from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University's uh, political science department as a former chair there. He's also spent time at the Mississippi State University uh, as a professor at Clark University in Massachusetts, but more importantly, he is also a local activist. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Ms. Priestley Johnson, and I have to read what her bio said because it really touched me. Who am I? My name is, who am I? My name is Priestley Marie Johnson. I'm a daughter, a sister, an aunt, an activist, a Howard alumni, and God's creation. Uh, and what I noted from her work and what she has done uh, as the strategic director, director of strategic partnerships at When We All Vote, what I noticed is she's a person, uh, I would like to think like myself, uh, that uh, has taken the motto to heart and is living the creed of the motto of truth and service every day. And that's no, that's why she's here. So let me get after these introductions. Would you like to just say a quick, uh, uh, just a minute or two about yourselves? I, other people are talking for you. Just a quick minute or two before we get into the questions. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Awesome. Well, thank you all for having me. My name is Priestley Johnson. Um, and I, I, lo I love that you took that from my bio. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm the Director of Strategic Community Partnerships here at When We All Vote. In my role, I help over 400 organizations get the resources and tools to take action towards each and every election. So we make sure that they have resources to train their members, their networks, their surrounding communities, staff and employees to register to vote, not only register themselves to vote, but also be advocates and um, advocates and liaisons within their community to promote voter education, voter engagement, and also voter, voter turnout. Um, so that is my work. I, I lead the strategy in making sure that more uh, people, uh, communities of color specifically, and young people turn out to vote this upcoming election. And I do take it to heart. So I really appreciate that note. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we appreciate all of your efforts uh, and you're just beginning. Dr. Perry. Yes, hi, I'm Ravi Perry. I'm a professor and chair in the Department of Political Science, which has been uh, a department at Howard since 1928, founded by Ralph Bunch. Of course, the first African-American to receive a PhD uh, uh, in, in uh, political science in the United States and to also be president of the American Political Science Association. And of course, one of the founders of the United Nations. So you are so right that these are really tough shoes to fill along with a line of folks including Ron Walters and Emmett Dorsey and, and Marguerite Ross Barnett and so many others. And so I'm privileged to be uh, 
uh, in this position here at, at Howard. Political science is the second largest major now at Howard University. Our majors have doubled in the past three years um, in size. And, and our graduate program was recently ranked in the top 70 by US News. And so we're really proud of our uh, efforts to uh, continue to diversify our curriculum uh, to speak to the needs of this new current, very activist oriented uh, on all kinds of questions impacting the black global world politically. Uh, and uh, if you are interested or you know some um, family members of yours who are wanting to come to Howard, please send them our way to political science. We'd appreciate educating them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Perry. And I want to start the first question uh, to Ms. Johnson, and that is uh, um, just a general question. Um, what's the impact of Black women voters? Awesome. I think, you know, as a Black woman, I'm happy to take this question. Um, I think that we saw the impact of Black women voters in this past 2020 election. We saw it in Georgia. We saw it um, taking shape um, across the nation. We know that, uh, I mean, all of us know a Black woman. We know that when Black women set our mind to something, we can turn out and turn up for our community. And so I, I definitely uh, think that we are um, definitely outpacing, um, Black women consistently outpace national rates of voter turnout. And that's why we are honestly a, a, a foundation of the Black vote that is constantly being spoken to. We want to ensure that everyone's voices are heard and, and especially those who have been historically left out. That's why we're also making sure that these Black women who are taking these action to make sure that more people, more uh, that Black women who are taking these actions to register voters, to turn out their community, to make sure that more people are, uh, are involved in the political process uh, are, are being heard. And so we see what happened in Georgia. Georgia is a great example. We saw Black women show up at each at, at um for the uh for the runoff election in in make sure that they were able to mobilize their communities we saw them in their the take shape in whether it was their local community organization or they were a part of their national organization their d9 sororities they were able to turn out and show up for each and every elect for for that uh specific election we when we think about uh the historical length of Black women and their impact. We, we have to mention Black suffragettes like Sojourner Truth and Anna Julia Cooper, who have um, laid the foundation um, for historic turnout and legislation that ha has been able to um, uh, pass and really impact women and not only women, but the entire Black community. So when I think of the impact of the Black woman vote, I think of the impact of the, the, the Black vote in general right now. And of course, we want to expand that electorate. We still want the voices of Black men to be even more encouraged. We I, I'm here kind of beating that drum on my end. I'm like, more Black men get more involved. But right now, Black women are doing it. And there's still so much work to do and we when we look at that impact there is still so much work to do be done but black women really are um here to uh to, uh, to kind of beat the drum uh within our black community and get it done we also see what was done currently uh recently with uh katanji brown jackson and the rallying spirit um there was this campaign called we have her back and i know <laughs> Black women were were beating that drum saying, you know, you might see her in the forefront, but we're here in the background calling our senators, making a campaign, organizing to make sure that more people can advocate for um, uh, a, a Supreme Court justice just like that. And I think that is that impact. We are mobilizers, we're organizers, and we are here in our democracy to show up and show out. So we, we're, we're here to make that impact. There's going to be a great thesis by hopefully a Howard student or a PhD student on the mobilization uh, on that Supreme Court nominee. Just what you said, that it was powerful. Uh, it was absolutely powerful. Uh, Dr. Perry, um, so what issues do you think are going to drive people to the polls and frankly, in some instances, drive people from the polls? 
in the midterm of 2022. Well, I'd like to echo a little bit with, that was just shared about uh, Black women and how central Black women have been at the polls um, and driving both people to the polls and driving some of the issues that have become mainstream now uh, as part of the Democratic Party platform that does in fact motivate people to the polls. And, and just another really cool fact about black women now that really is dem demonstrating the, the level of both access and power and influence that they are increasingly having as well on voting rights. You know, there are three black women secretary of states now in uh, uh, California and in um, I believe Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, that, that, that right. Yeah, yes, California, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. And, you know, that's a total of like 40 million people almost. And so they will have, you know, access to uh, influence the voting procedures in those three states. Uh, and that's never happened before. And so, yes, Black women are leading the way in many ways. And, and some of the issues that will matter to African-American voters will be those that will primarily matter to Black women, uh, because they have been the driving electorate of that 90% of population that we know of African-Americans that tend to identify with a particular party and tend to be the ones that uh, vote more readily, particularly in um, urban and metropolitan areas. And so that what we saw in the last couple of elections is that uh, issues that are relative to Black communities in rural areas also becoming important. And some of those issues are shared between folks, whether you live in urban or rural areas. So, you know, student loan forgiveness, you know, really matters. The, the continued challenges uh, as it relates to health and, you know, and more African-Americans dying from COVID. It doesn't matter if you live in downtown Brooklyn or, you know, or in rural Mississippi. Um, you know, th those are the challenges that uh, African-Americans are sharing. And so um, um, healthcare access remains one of the issues that will drive people to the, po to the polls. Um, I do think voting uh, uh, protection is what will, will drive a lot of people uh, uh, to the polls. Uh, and, and then finally, um, I, I do think that it, the economic, of course, output um, is going to be very important. What we're seeing challenges as it relates to Black youth unemployment um, and certainly unemployment as it relates to those with various kinds of abilities that are, are underemployed. And of course, we still have this significant gender pay inequity gap. Um, all real main issues that drive folks uh, to the polls. And I think in the midst of this global catastrophe of, of course, the war in Ukraine um, that challenges some of these issues because money that otherwise could be used uh, in the federal budget for these some of these social programs will be d directed in other areas and that's going to you know ruffle some feathers for some people in terms of what the priority should be for the next couple of months until we get to the midterms very good very good um it's a funny thing as i've gotten older um i know i'm the last person probably uh in america to go and try to uh engage young people to vote uh, so I'm so glad that we have uh, Ms. Johnson here, uh, most especially as a, a, a recent alumni of Howard, to talk about the not only the impact of young people voting, but the types of outreach you all are doing in order to encourage young people to participate in the democratic process uh, and what you all are doing uh, at uh, When We All Vote. Yeah, well, as our resident young person, I am uh, I am encouraged to pr provide some perspective on the youth electorate, and I think I would love to start out by saying the youth electorate is larger and more diverse. Um, than the national average, uh, and and it's and it's really encouraging, especially as we look to the future of these young people getting involved. And I I, I would love to just share some statistics with you all about um, just the the encouragement of of what's happening in our in our nation. So I'd love to share. Like so, in twenty sixteen. Between 2016 uh, 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 national election and 2020, there was an 11 point increase of youth voter turnout in our nation. That means we went from a 30% 
to a 50%. I, I want to be very clear. Youth in 2016 were voting at 30%. And now we're at 50%. And I know like we're like, oh my gosh, 50%. I know we can do better. And that's where I'm here to also say. But I'm also saying that there is a fever. This this jump has been um is is increasing exponentially because the um the fervor within the youth community to get more and more in, in, involved in their nation. They have seen um they're living through all of these uh, major moments in history. I mean, they they're living through George Floyd. They're living through, um, you know, a, an entire pandemic. They're they're seeing the healthcare system in their face. They're seeing the criminal justice system in their face. They're being confronted with gun violence. They're being confronted with all of these things. And it's not something you can say, "Hey, wait till you get older, and you, when you understand better, you can get involved." That's not what this 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 youth population is about. They're like, "Oh, we vote." when we get 18 bet they're they're in it to win it so i think there's so much credit to be given to this youth population because they are ready to get involved our job is to say great love the encouragement but how do we feel that encouragement into learning about what the system is and how to make change you can't i mean i love protesting i'm number one protester out here got my picket sign too i'm with you too but protest is the beginning of the process and it needs to be followed through with action and accountability and then action can look like voting and and the accountability can look like calling your senators and making sure that they know that you're paying attention because a lot can happen when you're not paying attention and i'm love i know we're going to get into a conversation about federal laws as well so I'm looking forward to that too. But I know that when we see these, uh, these populations of young people start to take action, start to get involved, our job is to foster that encouragement, give them the right direction and say, go, here's the mic. Get your, get your other young people involved. The best way to reach young people is to give them the mic and also tell them to speak to their peers. They, they have an incredible perspective on what they think this nation should look like, what it, they think it should be. And they're the best messengers for their own community. I mean, us, I mean, I'm a little bit out, but I'm still in, <laughs> but having the, the right voices speak to each other. I mean, there's only so much me or a celebrity can do. We're starting to really start, um, uh, what is it called? Flatten the hierarchy, especially when it comes to young people. They're like, oh, that's a celebrity. I just tweeted them and they responded to me. It's, there's, there's not that much of a, um, of a, of that like oh my gosh Beyonce just told me to vote type of thing anymore so what we our job is to do is to say who are they listening to which is is statistically their peers and how do we get the information to their peers so that they can share it internally within their networks and to respect the way that they communicate respect the way that they communicate on their TikToks on their Instagrams on whatever they got going on and say hey use whatever way you you do you and use it for to, to spread the message and make sure that more people understand the political process. And our job is to provide education, be like, hey, you got the forefront, I'm gonna give you the information, I'm gonna lay it up for you, and you're gonna slam it, um, and you're gonna slam it in, in the um in the basketball hoop, y'all. I I'm I'm gonna mix a lot of sports metaphors, but you guys get what I'm saying. Um, but our job is to really just keep keep that fire. And at When We All Vote, what we have is a program called My School Votes. And I know that many people here, they may, uh, we're alumna, we're out of school, we're even out of um, we're even out of uh, the youth population scene, but guess what we do know? We do know young people that are ready and able to take action and want to take action. So here are two different ways. So if you have, know a young person in high school that wants to um, start taking action and to start making sure that their school community is registered to vote, we have a very simple program called My School Votes. And if you go to When We All Votes uh, website, it should be right on there. And basically these young people can get a toolkit and they can get started and get ready to um, join some trainings and learn how to register people to vote within their school community. We also have a program specifically for HBCU students. Um, so I'm going to wink wink at all of our current um, our any of our administrators that are on college campuses are on um, Howard's campus or any of our uh, young people that are currently on Howard's campus to say that 
we are trying to give $3,000 to HBCUs that want to do voter registration work or continue to do that work. We want to encourage them. We're not ever saying that the work is not being done. We're here to in encourage it, propel it, and make sure that it's as successful as it can be. So we have a program called our HBCU uh, Voting Squad Challenge. And basically what we're looking for is school leaders within, within the school community that um, can also receive grant funding. You have to be a part of an organization. And we're able to give you $3,000 to join a few voter registration trainings, measure your impact with us, and um, help turn out your school community because uh, HBCUs are full of young Black communities and guess who needs to turn out to vote our young black communities and we're here to help and we're here to start to take action and I'm, i'll be happy to share some of those links in our chat in just a moment absolutely if you would do that, that that's important but i want to harken back to something that you said earlier uh as a person who worked for um jesse jackson um for a number of years uh one of his focal points were um that Dr. King taught him was when there's activism and we need to go and march, but there needs to be federal legislation after the activism. There needs to be changes of policy after that activism. If you are just marching for no reason, you're just getting your steps in. Uh, and going back to that, we're gonna talk about Georgia uh, with, with, with uh, uh, Dr. Perry. There have been several marches uh, but this time you're not really marching for something, you're, you're marching against uh, 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 what people see in, in our community as going against the democratic process of, uh, of shrinking. Uh, you want to talk about flattening, flattening the democratic process for, for many people uh, in, um, uh, in Georgia specifically. Let me go step one step back. Um, with Ms. Johnson to, for her to think about. Uh, and that is, do you think the increase in young people voting has anything to do with some of the, in certain states, some of the, um, 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 uh, the diminishing of the felon laws uh, where felons can't vote? So just think about that. Just think about where that increase actually came from. You know what I mean? Uh, because there have been 10 years of people trying to incorporate returning citizens and the ability to vote. And many of those persons were 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, and maybe they have gone through the process for two years. So they're 21 and 23 voting now. But just just go on one year, just think about where that huge in, uh, increase came from. But Dr. Perry, sorry to do that, but... Uh, um, um, no worries, if I can just say one thing on the returning citizens, because I do a lot of work in this space and it's actually a very, uh, I'm very passionate about this specific community, especially as uh, someone, I'm gonna take that, someone who internalizes truth and service, especially in the black community. Um, I, I do see that the increase, it can be due to that, but I also wanna cite that the, the young community is getting more encouraged. And I do wanna say, especially when it comes to the returning citizens community, there is so much more work we can do to help in, um, uh, expand their right to vote. And uh, we've seen states like Florida, Florida, for example, ha has ha passed legislation that has allowed their, um, their uh, their uh, people that are off of probation to actually vote, which is should be their 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 ability, and that has allowed. They've also we've also seen organizations like Reform who've actually helped pay down people's. Uh, I believe they're called restitutions. Please forgive me if I'm using the wrong term, but um, and that has allowed more people to vote. So there is a an incredible wave within. Um, the uh, Black community, but also Black community activist group that is allowing and really pinpointing the, uh, the impact of returning citizens. And that's another way we can always filter some energy and, and also direct some energy to making sure that more people are turning out to vote and having their voice heard in each and every election. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to do that, uh, Dr. Perry, but um, I think it's important to get it out, and most especially with this uh, uh, population. But it will also have an impact in Georgia. Uh, uh, returning citizens will certainly have an impact in Georgia. Uh, what, what do you see on Georgia's uh, 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 landscape, uh, voting landscape for the midterms of 2022? 
Well, you know, it's really, really important for them um, uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's the first major election where these new restrictive voting laws will come into play. And I think it's important to review, you know, kind of how, how we got to where Georgia matters at all uh, in terms of the grand scheme of things. I mean, for decades, Georgia was pretty much a reliably, you know, Republican state in terms of national politics and statewide offices. Uh, but because of a, a series of consecutive elections led by several on the ground uh, groups there, including Fair Fight and so many others um, um, that they've collaborated with, uh, has really helped change the tide building on the demographic diversity uh, uh, throughout the state of Georgia. Um, and so that has led to uh, this shift. You know, the other part of January 6th that we forget about uh, was that on that same day, that was the day that, of course, John Ossoff and uh, Raphael Warnock uh, really reinvigorating this historic Black Jewish coalition uh, uh, in Black communities, particularly in Georgia, but uh, the historic civil rights coalitions, of course, that led to much of our 20th century progress uh, was evidenced there in their election, there, uh, in that special election that was largely driven by much of the on the ground activism that we were talking about earlier. Um, this is also in part, I would argue, in response to how uh, Georgia voters rallied after Stacey Abrams' uh, gubernatorial loss uh, in 2018, in which she lost by less than 55,000 votes. And, and of course, it, you know, the, the other thing that people forget about this, that at the time she was running against the then Secretary of State, who of course has the authority over elections. Uh, and so, I mean, it's a clear conflict of interest, but I, you know, I don't have a law degree, so, you know, maybe that's a question for someone else. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, that, that was the context under which that election happened. And so she, of course, is a candidate again. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the Georgia voters uh, have realized uh, even more so now in the last several cycles how important it is uh, to participate in what really is this new generation of civil rights movements today. You know, if we are not protecting the vote, then the right to vote that was garnered by our far four parents and four uh, uh, mothers and fathers uh, in the movement of uh, uh, generations before would then uh, not uh, uh, be, will be in vain. And so I think many, many people are realizing that we have the responsibility uh, to protect uh, that vote. And wh what do we mean by protection? So in this context, the uh, uh, Senate bill that uh, uh, Governor Kemp uh, signed into law that was now going to be in effect for the first time. You know, we know some of the things that got a lot of national attention about how, you know, you can't solicit people in line with water and food and those kinds of things. But also, uh, you know, the, the real uh, character of the law, uh, I think, is what we want to really focus on. One, it's important to realize these are state legislators. So wherever, whatever state you're in, uh, you need to know your state legislators. Uh, we'll talk about DC in a moment. I'm in DC right now. I have no state legislatures. That's another problem for another reason, um, uh, which would also help all of you in other states who don't live in DC. But that's a different connection uh, about statehood and the politics of, of disenfranchisement here. But if you have a, you live in the state, then you have state representatives. And those representatives actually have far more power to influence your day-to-day -day lived experience. Uh, as citizens in this country than do many of your uh, officials that get more national presence. And so your state rep, your state delegate, your state senator, uh, those individuals matter. Uh, they're the ones that set the congressional district lines uh, that then determine the federal distribution that comes to the area in which you live for the next decade. Uh, uh, those are the people uh, that determine the state curriculum standards that your children and grandchildren learn or either don't learn. Uh, whether they are or are not prepared for college. Uh, you know, and so these, these, these positions matter. And it was this body in Georgia that passed this bill uh, on a party line vote, I would say, uh, that, that makes it far more difficult uh, for uh, African-Americans, but also elderly and transient individuals like college students uh, to participate in the voting process. And there's a bunch of different ways in which it does this. Um, and um, it's not a, a partisan argument. It's a factual reality of removal of certain kinds of uh, options for people to uh, vote that would make it easier for certain kinds of populations that we know that have historically used those avenues. And so when you see those things going away, then you know that it's targeting those groups that effectively use those avenues in prior elections in which, of course, 
the current party in control of the state legislature there in Georgia uh, did not do as well. And, and, and so they want to uh, use these restrictive laws to reverse the outcomes that would then favor them. And the only way we beat this is by, in the current system we have, is by participating by voting. And so we, we can only beat voter suppression um, either in the courts or by going out and voting in mass mobilization ourselves. And uh, I will end by saying this, in every major city in the country, metropolitan region, uh, persons of color, uh, if we were able to maximize our voting power, would be able to influence the politics of that region, both descriptively and substantively even when we control for those who are unfairly disenfranchised or have not been fairly uh, uh, re-entried into the political process. And so we can control though what we can do ourselves and uh, those rates of 30 to 50% of folks showing up in state and local elections, that needs to stop. And as I would say as people of color, uh, we primarily need to at least both critique the system uh, James Baldwin said, right, I love America, which is, you know, paraphrasing, which is why, you know, I have the right to criticize her perpetually. So, you know, we're not saying that that's not something that we need to do as well. But I think we all agree here that protest is not enough. Um, protest needs to be followed up with legislative action, because that's the only way that our values are actually protected uh, when it's protected in law, regardless of who is in office. Um, it's funny you say that, because... Uh... First thing, I, I, I'm going to come back to you and talk about statehood because you shouldn't have mentioned it. Uh, uh, you really shouldn't have mentioned it. I'm going to circle back around. But that 30 to 50% uh, increase in young people is absolutely extraordinary. However, and I'm, I'm going on some old data, I think in 12 or 16, uh, and I believe it was 16 that African American women actually were the leading demographic in voting, and they voted at almost 68%. Uh, voted was very high. They surpassed white women as the uh, the block with the largest, you know, more more reliable uh, vote. Um, but because you mentioned the statehood, because the District of Columbia, uh, Dr. Perry, has the a larger budget than five states, larger budget than five states, um, yet those states have two senators each. Um, and we have a, a larger budget than them. Can you, can you distill kind of the argument uh, for DC statehood? Uh, I know that you are passionate about this. If the audience remembers, I said that he was a activist. You know, he has the degrees and all of this stuff and the professorship, but he is a ardent activist on this and other issues. Uh, would you mind, sir, to, to uh, elucidate on that? Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, yeah, I am. I'm vice chair of DC Vote, which is the longest organization, state with advocacy org here in the District of Columbia, uh, uh, which was originally a coalition of folks who just uh, uh, have agreed, maybe had different approaches, but agreed that there needs to be some right to self determination for the 800,000 or so folks that live in the District of Columbia. Of course, who historically have been mostly African American and certainly remained to be a plurality of African-Americans and those of African descent and certainly those who are black and brown. And so that, that is what the District of Columbia is. And I think it's important to always remember that our university sits in the District of Columbia. And so, you know, the politics of the District of Columbia are certainly intertwined with this illustrious university. Uh, and, and I think the challenge here for all folks is that, that um, um, the lack of statehood means lack of representation. Lack of representation means lack of a voice. Lack of a voice means you're disenfranchised. Disenfranchised means that you're less likely to want to participate in your local governing affairs and activities. Those who are less likely to do that tend to have uh, uh, lower levels of life chances, tend to have less educational outcomes, tend to make less money uh, in a capitalist system. So we can, so all of this is tied to why it's important to uh, participate, and if we're excluding these folks, which I will say, the only we're the only nation in the world where the the citizens of the capital of that nation don't have the same rights as everyone else uh, in the rest of that of that nation's country, and so uh, this is an injustice that needs to be fixed. I think just on that those grounds alone. But what's the politics behind this? Well, the, we have an amendment. 
uh, 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 from 1960s, which, which gave uh, uh, voters here in DC the, the right to have our votes counted in, as part of presidential elections. We can have a different discussion about the Electoral College and whether or not the vote even counts, even the, you know, given that the Electoral College technically you know, cast the ballots and not actual individual citizens. But nonetheless, right now, you know, DC voters do have the same right as all the other states uh, uh, and, and uh, territories in terms of being able to cast ballots in terms of uh, presidential elections. But that's it. You know, everything else that DC does has to be subject to approval by Congress. Everything that council does is subject to review by Congress. The budget is subject to review by Congress. The judicial system is subject to review by Congress. Right now, there are dozens of vacancies in the DC District Court, uh, 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 which of course makes it much harder for jurisprudence to be processed timely here. Uh, and, and that has been delayed by both Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, and so this challenge for folks, regardless of where you live, but if you care about Black interest, on whatever side of the aisle you may be, the challenge here is that Black interests are being denied for those folks who, if this were a state, it would become the first Black plurality state in the nation. And of course, DC would no longer be District of Columbia, would, would become Douglas Commonwealth, uh, of course, so aptly named. Um, and the lack of statehood uh, for these individuals uh, also uh, uh, continues to reverberate the lack of statehood that exists in other territories, like, in, like Guam or Puerto Rico. Uh, Supreme Court just yesterday just highlighted how uh, uh, we can, in fact, deny uh, uh, Puerto Rican citizens federal benefits. Uh, you know, so we have we have a long way to go to fully incorporate complete democracy uh, to Black people in this country. And statehood in D.C. is central to that, regardless of where you may live. And if you particularly live in Arizona or in West Virginia, uh, we need you to impress upon your U.S. senators there uh, to uh, consider this issue if this is something that you support. I'm just gonna chime in here. I just wanna be very clear and say it real frank. The reason that we are not a state is based in inherent racism. And I'm just gonna say that what it is, cause it is uh, a, a very racist policy. The fact that the, it, there it's very political and it's not necessarily what, it's not necessarily a fair um, concept. It's all based in politics and it's not based in the fact that we are people based in, in, in a place that should be fully represented, and that's just what it is. Uh, and, and it's really based in, into um, a, a long history of, of, of uh, racist ideals and not wanting to have a, a state that has an incredible population of Black people represented in this America. So, and that is that can be carried on to the other territories as well. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that was said real plainly. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, that's what you do in church. You make it plain. And this is uh, uh, put on by Howard Alumni uh, uh, Relations, so we can be real plain right here. Uh, Go ahead. You have last thing on that, um, Robbie, in your efforts uh, for D.C. statehood, When We All Vote is also here and is championing that as well. So we should definitely talk about that online. I'm going to say that in this public forum so you can hold me accountable. We are um, actually, we, we that's one of our legislations that we are beating the drum of. So however, we can be helpful. Oh, that's great. Absolutely. We should certainly do that. And and for the, all of you, again, wherever you are, you can help support the statehood movement in a variety of different ways. And I just encourage you to please do that. Essentially, the challenge here is that the bill has been passed in the House twice, which is historic. Uh, uh, and it uh, has not been taken up in the Senate because we don't have the complete support of all of the U.S. senators that you need to get it past the current Senate rules. And so uh, if you are interested in this bill, you can support by uh, you know, just Googling D.C. statehood uh, and uh, finding a variety of different organizations uh, on all sides of the aisle that support some version of representation for the folks that live here in the nation's capital. And that's really those two uh, bills are a a uh, testament to Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton's efforts in the 110th Congress and the 117th Congress, just by putting it on the books uh, and getting a vote in the House uh, was historic. Uh, so I just really want to also give her a shout out for that because it's uh, it's amazing. And one of the things I know she would say is, in addition to having a larger budget than five states, we have more people than two of those states. So that it's, it's not numerical, it's not monetary, uh, it may just be what Ms. Johnson said. We never know. 
we'll see. But uh, we, I want to applaud you all for both of your efforts uh, as a 25 year citizen in the district uh, in trying to get statehood uh, for the district. Uh, Ms. Johnson, what, what, what is voter apathy? We're hearing a lot about this word apathy. Well, love to talk about this. This is actually one of my favorite topics of 2022 because I feel like sometimes I kind of fall into this bucket myself. So voter apathy is the sentiment of a voter that they do not want to vote anymore. They don't feel like their vote is counted. They don't feel like their, their voice is heard. They do not feel like they are seen or represented or should continue in the political process. And I first want to say, okay, there's this, there's a certain amount of validation that should be extended to people that feel any type of way about their government. It is your nation and it is your government to feel any type of way about. And I understand that. But then with that, with that apathy, with that feeling, what are you giving up? Because the, if you succumb to that feeling, you're going to be giving up a certain amount of power that you have in, inherently as a citizen. And as a citizen, your power here is to have your voice heard. And there are many different ways you can have your voice heard. But when you opt out, when you say, I am going to go this way and not do the thing that I have power to do, which is to vote, which is to call your senators, which is to participate in your political process, which is to find out who is running for your school board, which is to find out which education your kids are getting in school, which is to find out uh, why there is no uh, grocery stores on in your community, why all of the things, why there is this pothole that keeps, you know, messing up everyone's car on the block over and over and over because you feel some type of way, which is okay. I just want to be very clear. There is validation in feeling some type of way and feeling your, like your voice is not heard. It is, you are giving up something. And in that giving up, the people that will show up, the people that continue to have their voices heard, they're gonna get louder and louder. And those people may not look like you and they may not sound like you and they may not have the same ideals as you, but guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna keep beating their drum and they're gonna beat it louder and louder and louder. And they're just hoping you don't show up. So when you don't show up over and over, guess whose voice uh, the people in office have to listen to, the people that do show up, because they are saying, you have, I, you have my vote, or I'm a part of this community, and my voice matters, and th that, is, that is true, because the people in the community who uh, do care about that pothole that keeps messing up everyone's car are not showing up, okay? So one thing I love to say to people that, um, you know, I, 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 I'm just also going to say, you know, certain administrations, they may, you may not agree with every single thing that they put out. Every, every person in office is not the person that's going to a hundred percent represent your ideals. And so what analogy I like to give to people is that voting and participating in the political process in participating in democracy is not it's not an Uber, okay? It's not gonna bring you from one place and it's not gonna drop you off at the place that you're you're supposed to be. That's just not what this is. That's not how it's designed to be because that would, uh, it would our political process was, was designed to do necessary turns incrementally towards a, an arc of, um, and towards an arc of progress. However, I, it's not an Uber. I would say that our political process is more like a bus. We are, you are trying to head in a certain de uh, destination. Maybe you need to walk a few blocks to this bus stop and the bus is gonna drop you off as close as you can get to your destination. And your job is to hop on that bus, get closer to your destination. And guess what? If you need to walk the rest of the way, then that's what you're gonna need to do. Maybe you're gonna need to wait for another bus and it may come around in another few years, but that is what the system is designed to be. And it's a really about understanding what the system is. And that unfortunately, it's not as quick as our attention span and that can be sometimes frustrating and I get it, but guess what? 
that's the system we have. So what we need to do is we need to organize. We need to understand. We need to organize. We need to mobilize. And I, I love to put another analogy in here because I love to talk about money. Money is something we all can get, get with, right? It's something we all can understand, especially as we, um, if you're an alum, a recent alumna or you're still in school or you're still out here, it's trying to get your first 401k. As a young person, I was like, what do I need to be putting my money into this 401k for? I don't even understand. When am I even going to get this money? I don't even understand. Once I started doing my research and understanding why I was doing it, I understand that this is a compound interest, that this is something that if I put my money in now, it will increase in its size and its ability to impact my life in the future. That's what voting is. Voting is putting in your investment now, voting every single year, showing up at town halls, um, calling your senators, calling the, the uh, city person that is in charge of that pothole. And then when you need to, you hold those people accountable. And because you have been there, you've been showing up, you've been participating in the process. When you take out that 401k, you're able to say, oh my gosh, this is the impact. This is my presence within the political process. And therefore I can hold you accountable because guess what? I'm an upstanding citizen. I participate all the time. And guess what? Now that I am a part of this, and especially as my young people, you can understand in the future when you are, you know, you're paying your taxes, you're really investing into the, the place that you reside, that you can have a larger impact. So Let me when interrupt I say you right there. Let me interrupt you right there. Yeah. Uh, I love your passion uh, because we want to make sure that we have enough uh, time for people to ask questions. Yes. And there's one question, uh, and uh, Ms. Lewis was correct. But this is probably going to have to go on to two. Uh, uh, um, two um, I'm saying shows, but, you know, two <laughs> shows. And I say it because we haven't talked about the John Lewis Act nor gerrymandering, mm -hmm. which are vital in this, elect in this midterm. Yes. But uh, I want to ask, please, uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you have any questions of the panelists, uh, provide your questions in the chat. We have one right now, and I think it was a very intriguing question. Um, and that is, uh, and when, dis uh, when discussing democratic priorities, President Biden's focus on Ukraine, uh, does it negatively impact the democratic message as well as impact other democratic candidates in their election if he focuses on Ukraine? Every news station keeps, uh, keeps relevant democratic issues that are focused on Ukraine 24-7. The media does not talk about the erasing of two black congressional districts because the Ukraine is more important priority. Um, what do you all say about that? And that goes back to gerrymandering, which we will probably need to come back to. Uh, great question. Anybody want to speak to, essentially this is the gerrymandering question uh, and the erasure of, uh, of uh, two African-American congressional districts, let yeah. alone the number of state districts that have been decreased as well. Yeah, so I'll be glad to take that one. I mean, ultimately, I mean, I think the challenge of any presidency uh, is the challenge of having to navigate multiple issues. So um, when an international calamity happens, it does distract from a domestic agenda. That is the case for any domestic agenda. And does that include, therefore, Black issues and issues that... Uh, a matter to uh, uh, perhaps members of the Democratic Party. Yes, it does, um, and um, and so so that's just that's just part of politics. Unfortunately, we just kind of have to accept that. Um, um, but uh, we can minimize the damage uh, if we had a better control over the redistricting in Congress. That again happens every ten years because of the census. So you remember, folks were you know knocking on your doors, asking you to fill out the census. You know uh, the reason for that primarily was so that we got to this point we are in now, where these state legislatures are drawing congressional district lines based on those new numbers. And of course, state legislatures draw those lines based on their partisan influences. And the majority of state legislatures are ha and have been for the majority part of this century controlled by a particular party that does not share the current uh, uh, values of the president of the United States. And so that is the challenge for this coming midterm cycle um, is that, uh, and many states have had challenges. So Ohio has had some challenges that has delayed the primaries, Maryland as well. 
uh, 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 here in DC even in terms of the redistricting of council wards uh, has, has has potentially uh, 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 come up against a delayed challenge in terms and of the ANC of the wards. That's yes, yes, so yes. granular, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry yeah, to interrupt. No, 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 you're absolutely right. Exactly, exactly. And so, but for most folks, it's your congressional district, which has about 800,000 people. And you have a member of Congress that represents you. Uh, and 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 those those districts change every 10 years. And you can be in one district one decade, out of one district another decade. The district could look a particular way one year, one decade and change and so on and so forth. This is mandated. It's one of the oldest things in the Constitution that we do a census. And because of that census, we do redistricting. And redistricting is based on population. And so when populations change, and I will say African-Americans have shifted and moved and migrated over centuries. And so in the migration in the early 20th century, you know, from the South to the North and the industrial North and, and you know, uh, and really uh, infiltrating much of the, you know, um, Midwestern cities and New England areas, et cetera, has now reversed back where many African-Americans are shifting back into Southern states. Well, Southern states have been, you know, controlled for the most part by uh, uh, certain uh, party members that some may argue have been anti some of the interests of African-American concerns. And so um, the challenge for um, us um, with redistricting always is to one, participate in your state legislative elections so you know the people who will be in the room crafting that map uh, that will impact your life in the next decade. And then secondly, if you're at the point where we are now, um, the best we can do uh, to uh, uh, with a with a redistricted map, uh, they're all all partisan predictions on either side of the aisle are based on prior elections. And so the best you can do, whatever your belief is, in terms of participating in government, uh, even with a redistricted or gerrymandered district, is to go out and vote and to surpass whatever that projection was by whatever party. Uh, and your participation would then. Uh, would, would outweigh the statistical um, uh, guess that we make essentially uh, when trying to pr make partisan predictions as it relates to these districts. Excellent. Uh, this panel has been very, ex uh, it's been wonderful. Um, we have a number of people um, that are here. Please ask your questions of this panel. As you can tell, they, they, um, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar, my favorite stanza is uh, um, uh, of his poem, Live the Creed. I'd rather watch your hand in motion for your tongue too fast may run. Uh, we have two panelists whose uh, hands are in motion. So let's take advantage of uh, the intellect as we have them now. Uh, Ms. Chapman, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and she also added uh, to the chat that, that she said those two congressional districts are in Florida. Florida, bellwether, uh, one of the more battleground oriented states. In fact, um, in 2000 elections, when it, we even coined the term battleground state, uh, most especially when people think about it now, uh, they're talking about Florida. Any other questions? And if there aren't any other if, questions- If I can, I just, mm -hmm. I'll make an interesting point about Florida. Florida is also controlled by the Republican Party, the state legislature. Now, this is what this is why this matters. Uh, it's because the Republican legislature handed the governor a, a, a different set of congressional districts prior to, which maintained these two plurality black majority districts, and the governor rejected his own party uh, in denying these two uh, districts to potentially give Blacks more congressional representation in Florida. So it's a quite interesting story. Uh, Ms. Kulmar, I uh, wanted to thank Ms. Johnson for providing the information. So uh, I think you may be hearing from her. Uh, uh, so very good. This is what this is for, is to disseminate good information to people who are gonna do something with it. Um, since we don't have any more questions, um, you know, are there any closing remarks are uh, by by you all, and I would I would say let's go to uh, Miss Johnson first, and then we will uh, uh, have you next, Ms. Uh, Dr. Perry. Wonderful. Um, so I I just want to say thank you again for having me, and I think that there is so much. I, I love conversations like this because I'm like, there's still so much work to be done, but it really always comes down. Um, there's still so much work to be done. And 
I, I, I want to be very clear. There's been 500 voter suppression bills, more than 500 voter suppression bills that have been introduced and over a hundred of them have been passed around the nation. Uh, and they've been in introduced into every single state that we've had. I mean, in Georgia, you can't even pass out water in line to register to vote, or, I mean, to, uh, to cast your ballot. And that's really important because there's so much more we can do to protect the access to the ballot box. And that is um, that really is our through line into ensuring each person's voice is heard. And so when we say access to the ballot box, we really want to be talking about um, making sure that more there's more polling locations, that there's more people like you and I that are at polling locate that are poll workers, and that we are also, you know, if you are a lawyer that you're uh, volunteering um, to protect our rights to be on the um, election protection hotline. There's so much more that you can do to help our, our nation because it's always going to come down to one person, one vote. And the more that they can diminish the one person, the one person to not show up to make sure that they feel like their vote doesn't matter to say like, hey, you, it doesn't matter. Oh, is it election day? Don't worry, go get some ice cream with some friends. No worries. But the more that they can diminish your um, fervor, your zest, your um, spirit to turn out to vote, to have your voice heard, the more that they will start continue to make decisions without your voice heard. Commit, do your research, do your education, take yourself and your friends and your family out to vote. And if you're looking to take action, please take, um, please consider taking action with When We All Vote. We are um, advocating for legislation. We're advocating um, to making sure that our Congress is listening to us. And we're also helping to turn out more and more people each in every election. So we hope that you do that work with us. And if you're not doing it with us, make sure you're doing it in your community as well. So thank you for having me. And I'm, I look forward to working with you all moving forward. And I'm happy to, um, to connect with anyone who, who wants to do this work. I couldn't have said that better because uh, the newest uh, Howard University alumna uh, that is a member of Congress was elected in February because of the death of uh, Representative Elsie Hastings. She won her Democratic primary by four votes, four votes. She went to the general, she won by a lot, but the only reason she won that Democratic primary is by four votes. And this is how, and now she is in Congress representing that district. Dr. Perry. One person, one vote, absolutely. It does come down to that uh, uh, still, uh, each and every uh, election. And we've talked about midterms today, which will come this November. Until then, uh, you likely have a primary wherever you live. And primaries historically are extremely low. And primaries are where you actually have the greatest opportunity to influence whatever your interest may be, because there's more diversity of ideological perspectives on either party in primaries. And so uh, you can participate wherever you are. Please look up. The primaries are likely going to be in May and June or, or, or in August or September, wherever you may live across the country in advance of the November uh, midterm election. And so please try to participate as much as you can. And by participating, we do, I do mean certainly voting. One of my goals always as a Black political scientist uh, is to encourage Black voting. And, you know, it would be great to get, you know, our numbers nationwide, right, where we can say 75, 80% of Black folks participated. Uh, we, as we, we don't need to be reminded, right, that this right was not always uh, uh, given to us. We had to fight for it. Thousands died for it. Uh, and uh, millions were abused for it and misused and treated for it. And the law still, of course, disenfranchises many of us because of those efforts. And so uh, we have the right to protect it now. Um, and I, I will say whatever your perspective is in terms of the current system, um, the system can't be improved without our participation. Uh, and so uh, I certainly implore your engagement with your politics, and that may inquire you to, require you to do a couple of things. It may mean that your regular TV watching of national news needs to shift to turn on more local stations, right? It may mean that you might need to read more local metro news uh, um, in your news feeds, on your cell phones, while you're waiting at the, at the bus stop. 
uh, rather than just the national kinds of hi highlights. Uh, that can often, you know, make us feel as though uh, we are um, insignificant in our own local community. And that is not the case. We need folks uh, to engage in your local neighborhoods, neighborhood organizations, all the way to participating in national elections, voting for the president and your U.S. representatives. Um, but it's um, all or nothing. I, um, and the system is made for us to participate, and it's made better when more of us participate. That's just simply a fact. Regardless of what the outcome of that participation is, the system is made better when those who are eligible can participate in voting. And re those who argue that the system is oppressive, it is, but it wasn't, but it's been less, it's less oppressive now than it was before. It will only continue to get less oppressive by those of us in choosing to engage in the system uh, to make it better. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I hope Bison everywhere participate in, in the political process. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Perry, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Howard University and the leadership of President uh, Frederick for hosting this as well. And I really wanna thank the Department of Alumni Relations and uh, Ms. Lewis, uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, event and I hope there are many more. Uh, and our panelists were extraordinary. Uh, Pastor uh, Trey Daniels is saying thank you. You, you all are looking at this, Ms. Moore. Thanks for the super information. Uh, we've done our duty, y'all. Thank you all. Enjoy the weekend.